and it should be live now, right? Yes, I can see us. Yeah, we're live. Okay, so let's get started. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us in another exciting fine seminar. My name is Adriana Maldonado Chaparro. I'm a professor at Universidad del Rosario in Colombia. And today I will be the host of the fine seminar. I'm really, really happy that you are all here today. And before announcing this week's um, speaker, I would make some announcements. First, I would like to thank our previous speaker, Dr. Abel Bernard from University of Regensburg in Germany for his great talk and discussion on individual variability and division of labor in social insects. Second, I want to announce our speaker for next week, Dr. Jane But Butterman from University of Manitoba in Canada. Uh, we'll be talking about reproductive tactics in a non-aggressive promiscuous squirrel. Also, I'll take advantage of this point to just make sure to tell everyone, next week we'll be announcing our program for the fine seminar in the spring 2023. So keep an eye on it. And later on, later on we'll be posting it on Twitter and on Mastodon as well, Facebook and Instagram. So, um, Another little um, announcement, just because every time we get new people joining, uh, this is a 50 minute seminar followed by, a, by an hour minute, an hour of discussion. During the seminar, please make sure to have your microphone muted um, and only open it while engaging with the speaker. During the discussion, please type in a question mark in the chat and I will call you. Um, if you're watching the stream live on YouTube, someone will, uh, Karsten will help us relay the questions to the moderator, which is me. And as usual, we, off, we encourage the students and early career to ask questions. And so with no further ado, I'll introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Mauricio Cantor. Mauricio is originally from Brazil, where he did his undergrad and his master's studies. And then he moved to Canada where he got his PhD in 2016 at Dalhousie University uh, with Dr. Whitehill, Whitehill um, as his PhD advisor. Um, well, since last year, Mauricio is an assistant professor in the Department of Fisheries, uh, Wildlife and Conservation Science at Oregon State University in the United States. There, he created and leads the Labyrintho Laboratory of Animal Behavior Interaction Research in the Ocean Lab. <laughs> uh, that's quite a name. Interesting, Mauricio. <laughs> Mauricio studies the intersections between behavior and ecology, both from a theoretical perspective and in the field, combining computer models with real world data, as you will see in his presentation. His research focuses on the interactions between humans and marine mammals, and this is because marine mammals have a great learning ability, social complexity, and also the exciting fieldwork that it entails. Um, so talking a little bit about his productivity, um, his publication record is quite impressive for being a young scientist. He has published around 60 articles in different peer review, scientific journal and contributed to over 14 scientific books. He publishes in a wide range of scientific journals such as behavioral ecology and social biology, behavioral ecology, animal behavior, oecology, trends in ecology and evolution, and more specialized ones such as mammal biology, marine and French water ecosystems, and many others. Um, and well, I could keep telling a lot of his achievements, but at this point, I think I'm just gonna introduce the seminar title, which is Mechanisms and Conservation of Human-Animal Cooperation. 
And thank you, Mauricio, for accepting our invitation. The mic is all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for this very kind introduction. And well, thank you everyone for being here and for the invite to speak to you today. It's an absolute pleasure to speak here at the Frontiers in Social Revolution. Let me start by sharing my screen here. Let's see if we got this right this time. So, uh, one second. Yeah. Does everything look good? Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. So hi everyone, my name is Mauricio Cantor. And like everybody else here, I'm fascinated by animal behavior, behavior ecology. And we all know that behavior is really important, not only because already famously said is everything we do from the moment we're born all the way to the moment we die. Not only that, but everything that we do has an impact on something else. So we interact, we interact with the environment, we interact with our peers and with other species. And those interactions have consequences. And today I'd like to give you an example of how we can try and measure those consequences for individuals, populations, and communities. And it's an example that matters for me because it's an iconic case of social foraging that is specific to a place nearby where I grew up. So I, I grew up by, by hearing stories about it. But I also wanna try and make the case that it matters for you too, because it illustrates how the behavior that we humans choose to do can make a positive or a negative impact on the diverse world around us. So the social in our talk today will be related to social foraging, more precisely cooperative foraging between two top predators, and it will also be related to social ecological systems. So let's start with some good news. If you look around, nature is still diverse. And for as long as there has been natural history buffs like us around, there has been fascination for such a diversity. In any scale that we look at, be it ecosystems or habitats, species or individuals, life forms and their strategies are dynamic and they are diverse. But when we humans interact with this diverse nature, the consequences are bound to be profound and they're rarely beneficial for both parties. Throughout our history, the human ability to learn how to interact with nature has been key to our global ecological success, yes, but also to a global ecological crisis. And the escalating human wildlife conflicts are no news to anyone here. And these conflicts, they contrast sharply with the very few cultural practices that benefit both humans and animals. And today, most of the historical cases of human wildlife cooperation are in decline or already gone. There are some left, uh, for example, some cases of honey guide birds working with honey hunters and dolphins working with artisanal fishers. So understanding the conditions under which these human wildlife interactions can flip between beneficial and antagonistic is critical if you are to align human interests with wildlife protection. But this is a challenging endeavor because it requires us to uh, unpack how environmental and behavior factors interact to shape the benefits that individuals receive. And this can be even trickier on a rapid, rapidly changing world. So today we will look into one of such systems, the cooperation between artisanal fishers and bottlenose dolphins. And we'll try to understand how these interactions take place among individuals, and then we will scale up to, uh, to see how they scale up to shape uh, dynamics of the community. So first we'll zoom in to understand the mechanics of this uh, wildlife cooperation, uh, which is uh, surprisingly poorly understood to the day. And second, we will zoom out and infer the consequences of these interactions to the resilience of the social ecological systems that they form together. So the story takes place in southern Brazil, where uh, wild bottlenose dolphins interact with artisanal net casting fishers to try and get the same resource, uh, mullet fish. So do dolphins will hurt fish towards the coast, where a line of fishers wait for specific cues that they interpret as the right time to cast their nets. And then in turn, dolphins will go after the share and people of faith like they probably can do it anymore. Anyway. 
So this is an intriguing system because the ecological interaction here are taking place between uh, two, top two top predators. And this interaction seems to be stable for the last 140 years that we know of. And it seems to be socially transmitted across generations. And while the participants in the systems are only three, the big picture is still rich. For example, we need to understand the distribution of prey and space and time, how many fish are there, and how is the abundance of this fish affected by environmental conditions. On the fisher side, we need to know how they synchronize their behavior with the dolphins and how the synchrony affects their fishing success. And on the dolphin side, we need to understand finally uh, the benefits that they gain from interacting with humans and how the existence of these interactions can impact, for example, their population dynamics. So to tap into these questions, we, we use these multi-platform system to try and sample the environment, the ecological interactions among the three species simultaneously above and underwater. For example, we use sonar cameras, like the blue uh, thing you've seen there, to quantify the fish. We track dolphins with drones and track fishers with GPS bands and, and heartbeat loggers to quantify their spatial behavior and coordination. We photograph the dolphins and interview the fishers to find out who socializes with whom. And we record dolphin echolocation and observe fishers at the beach to quantify the rewards for interacting. And then now we are able to assess in real time how things work at that very fine scale that matters for this interaction. So our first step will be understanding how environmental conditions influence the prey that in turn shapes the propensity for these two predators to interact. So the, mullet, the abundance of mullet, which are migratory, they're likely to be influenced by regional and local environmental conditions. In the winter time, the mullet migrate along the coast of Argentina and Brazil, and when conditions are suitable, they enter these estuaries and lagoons, like our study site in Laguna, southern Brazil, to feed and grow. And the, the first step is then estimating how many fish is there available for fishers and dolphins to catch. But this doing this is more difficult than my scene because most of the time the water are very the water is very murky, so it's impossible to see where the fish is. Then to solve this problem, we deploy this so-called high-resolution sonar imaging system, which basically projects acoustic energy and generates in, uh, digital images from this, much like an ultrasound and a uh, pregnant woman, for example. So by filtering and processing these videos uh, as sonograms, we can relate the, the, the presence of fish represented by the pixel intensity there to the conditions that we know that influence the migration of mullet. For example, wind speed interaction, tide state and tide velocity, water temperature and transparency and things like this. So from this kind of data, we fit the models and then we can um, look at these conditions. The sonar imaging suggests that there are better and worse conditions for the presence of fish at a very fine scale. Um, so for example, the migratory mullet school seems to be 35% more likely to be detected at the interaction site during low flood tide and warmer days. Now, in the absence of dolphins, the fishers go to the water and try and follow this uh, very same environmental cues. But the, very, the few fishers that try their luck by themselves, here represented in the y-axis, they tend to go in the same conditions, um, the same uh, environmental conditions represented in the X, uh, axis, but they tend to follow the dolphins more closely because they know that without dolphins, catching any fish is very unlikely. Here, I'm showing you an uh, x-axis, the fish suitability, those environmental conditions for fish, and the number of fish caught by fishers in cases uh, where there's no dolphin around. So we can see that it's pretty, pretty much zero, except for this lucky guy that once got about 10 fish, but everybody else knows this is a losing battle. Now, by using GPS on uh, trackers on, on the fishers, we can then look at their movements. And this shows that they respond very strongly to the presence of dolphins and much more than they do to the environmental cues. So here in this map, I'm showing you the beach where they stand and wait for the dolphins and in the water where they stand in line and interact with the dolphins. And there's an example of one guy that run into the water when the dolphins arise. 
arrive uh, at, the, at the place. So we can see there's a, a pretty good correlation in the number of dolphins and number of uh, fishers in the water. So this suggests that there's some active attraction between these predators. Now, to, uh, the key is that just the sheer presence of dolphin in the area does not impact the fisher's success. There's something else to it. So to investigate now the effects that dolphins and fishers have on each other, we will quantify their behavior synchrony and foraging success in four pseudo-treatments uh, using a natural experiment approach. So the first uh, pseudo-treatment is the uh, synchronous interaction is the one that I show you in the video, the dolphins will approach, make a behavior cue, the fishers interpret at the right time to react and cast their nets. Then we have three cases of asynchronous interactions. The first one is when dolphins approach, make a cue, but, but the fishers react either too late or cast their nets in, a, in the wrong spot. And then there's two other cases of mismatched actions. Uh, the dolphins don't make a cue, but the fishers cast, or the other way around. And I mean, I keep seeing cue behavior cue. So what is that? This is uh, the dolphin cue is a stereotypical behavior that prompted the, the fishers to cast their nets. The most common ones is this very uh, distinct sudden dive when they arch their back just in front in front of the fishers that the fishers locally call as a jump. So from these kinds of finding that we can now start looking at what the dolphins are doing to the fishers foraging. And so back to the sonar imaging, it reveals what dolphins are doing to the social foraging. So here in the y-axis, we have the mullet detections, the, the uh, pixel intensity and in our uh, sonar imaging. And in the y-axis, the x-axis, sorry, we have the time. And the dashed line represents the moment of the dolphin cue. In red, we have the synchronous interactions, and the other side, we have all the other three asynchronous interactions. So imagine that migratory mullet passing through that canal, it's out of reach for this uh, net casting fishers, but then with dolphins pushing or hurting the, the fish skull here towards the coast, more or less where our sonar are, they increase the, they, they turn this area into a high quality patch, a temporary high quality patch for this net casting fish. So here in the graph, we can see that the mullet detections increase more or less after the dolphin approach. And by contrast, we don't see such a clear pattern uh, in any of those three asynchronous interactions. And this is true for all, the, all those three types of it. Then by sitting at the beach, it's easy to quantify when fishers get out of this. We can count, measure, weigh their catch. And there are two messages. First, that is net casting is pretty hard, so they don't get much out of it all the time, but they do get more out of it with the synchronous interactions. And this is almost independently of those uh, environmental conditions for the uh, fish suitability. So here in the y-axis, we have the total number of fish caught by the fishers. And in the x-axis, those uh, environmental conditions for fish suitability. Again, in red, the synchronous interactions here when the fishers follow the dolphin's cue, and on the other side, the uh, asynchronous interactions. So the take-home message here is that the dolphins when they and fishers, when they synchronize the behavior, the foraging success of fishers can be as high as 10 times more, regardless of the fish suitability. And then this obviously leads to, to the, the next question, what is in there for dolphins then? So the hypothesis will be the dolphins get the same kinds of benefits from interacting with humans, more fish. But quantifying the dolphin benefits is much trickier. Uh, we First, we rarely see what's underneath the water because again, the water is uh, most of the time murky like this. And this is where the real work starts. In, we can use the same trick of seeing with sounds that we did to count fish using the sonar, but this time rely on the dolphin's own sonar to find out how much they invest in foraging and when exactly they invest in, into more actively foraging. So data from other studies in controlled settings in, in captivity, for example, where they put a camera and a hydrophone stick to the dolphin's uh, head, they show very clearly that not only dolphins echolocate like everybody knows, but they change the rate of emission of these uh, 
pulses of sounds uh, according to what they're doing. So when they are scanning the environment, they will produce this echolocation clicks in a more regularly spaced manner. And as they home on a prey, or perhaps even when they catch prey, they will increase the emission of these clicks, therefore reducing the interclick intervals. So uh, we can try and tease apart these different echolocation processes by uh, measuring when in time dolphins are emitting uh, these different, different types of, of clicks. And that's what we did. We then combined some machine learning tools with, uh, yeah, with some uh, algorithms to, to uh, detect and classify these clicks over time before and after the interactions. And I'll, I'll uh, save you from the details, but the results are here. And again, one of those uh, colorful graphs, again, we have an X, X is the time relative to interaction showed in the dashed line. And the Y axis, we have the number of clicks of those terminal bus clicks when they are homing on prey only, disregarding anything else. And in red, we have the synchronous interactions and, uh, and the other side here, all the three types of asynchronous interactions. Then again, we found that dolphins produce disproportionately more of those terminal bus uh, clicks in response to the fishers casting the nets in synchrony with their cue. And again, we don't see this increase pattern here in any of those asynchronous interactions. So like on the Fisher side, our models predict that foraging synchrony is key for the dolphin success or the dolphin active foraging in this case. I know the active echolocation indicates the dolphins are homing on fish, but this is not the same as saying that they're catching fish. However, if they're doing this consistently, uh, they're foraging more actively consistently only after the the time it takes for the nets of the fishers to fall in the water and sink over the, the uh, fish school, this is a, a pretty good indication that they might be getting something out of this whole business. So uh, previous studies have hypothesized uh, how the dolphins benefit from interacting with dolphins and with fishers, sorry. And we didn't expect to see this from in our underwater footage because that was set to count uh, mullet fish, not, not exactly the dolphin behavior. But uh, eventually we caught something that suggests one of different way that dolphins might be um, benefiting from interaction, interacting with the fishers, which is by interacting straight with the net, trying to take fish out of the net. So we know that a tight and coordinated fish school it's a textbook example of defense against predators. And the hypothesis will be that the gnats will disrupt this school, either by breaking it, so thereby leaving some few fishes around for the dolphins to catch, or trapping the fish and facilitating uh, the catch by the dolphins. So the video here might be staggered. I don't know if you can see. I'll walk you through three uh, key moments. So the first is when the gnat uh, hits the water and Keep in mind that this, this uh, underwater camera, it, it gives us a bird eye view. So we are seeing things from the top down. So here we have this circle representing the casting net hitting the water. And here we got the dolphin approaching. And he approached the net and uh, where in this case has just one or two fish trapped in sight. And then that moment where a lot of shuffling around uh, suggested the dolphins are going underneath the net to catch uh, trapped fish. And sometimes when you uh, count the fish at the beach, we can see some evidence of dolphin interacting with the, with the, uh, with the net as well. All right, so this is the first part to sum it up. Uh, the availability of fish is influenced by the environment, environmental conditions, and by dolphins pushing them the fish towards the coast where the fishers are. And then the dolphins actions, dolphins and fishers actions, reactions and successes are highly dependent on each other. So this first close look to this interaction uh, revealed basically two features that behavior synchrony between the predators is crucial here. But he also now looking at our long-term data over the past 15 years, uh, studying the population there with other colleagues, it reveals a lot of variation, a lot of variation across all the actors in the system. So there's variation in the quality of the individual players 
the individual predators. And there's also variation in quantity of the resource, the prey that underpins their interactions. So as part of our research, we've been interviewing uh, fishers and quantifying the behavior over the past 16 years. And it's clear that there some fishers are more experienced and perform better than others. And now from uh, our drone data, we can quantify the position, the timing, the casting distance, and how well they can cast their, their nets. And it's also pretty clear that some are better than others. So we see a similar variation in performance on the dolphin side. Um, the fishers uh, recognized this for a long time. So all the individuals in this small and resident population of about 50 to 60 dolphins, they're pretty uh, clear in their abilities to herd fish and cue the fishers in. So uh, the fishers recognize this and, and dub them as good, lazy, and bad dolphins according to their, their uh, ability to interact. And the not so good news here is a variation on the third axis, on the, on the prey availability. So the regional mullet stock in southern Brazil seems to be in decline. And this data comes from uh, capture per unit of effort in the small uh, scale fisheries around that area. So variation in the predator skills and the prey uh, availability is important because this is where the resilience of this uh, social ecological system relies on. So behavior variation can translate into a lack of synchrony among the dolphin's actions and the fish's reactions, therefore lowering their successes. And like in any other type of cooperation, the persistence of this interaction depends on the payoffs that individuals receive and declining payoffs can perhaps prompt predators to abandon or change strategies, abandon this tactic. And this can only get worse if the fish is indeed becoming less um, available. And indeed, when you look at, at the long-term uh, population data, we see that both dolphins and fishers are undergoing a high population turnover. And nowadays we see fewer cooperative uh, individuals and the frequency of dolphin fish interaction seems to be declining more recently. Um, and this again can only get worse if there's fewer fish around. So that raises the question, how long will this uh, mutualism or this uh, interact cooperative forging persist? And can we anticipate any tipping point in this interaction payoffs to prevent dolphin and fishers to abandon this tactic? But before getting to that, let me just tell you briefly why we should care about this. This cooperative forging matters for the dolphins. Cooperating with uh, net casting fishers increase their survival probability. Those good and lazy dolphins, they have about 13% higher chance of survive to the adult life than the non-cooperative dolphins, the bad dolphins. And this cooperative foraging used to shape their social lives into uh, different social communities. And now with the decline of this uh, frequency of interaction, this social structure has been dismantled. And cooperative foraging also matters for this humble fishing community because dolphins generate good food and good income, yes, but they also provide other ecosystem services such as leisure, recreation, and a sense of belonging, a sense of uh, cultural belonging to that place. So as you can see in this uh, images, fishers are very connected to dolphins and these connections, they go way beyond just business. However, should the payoffs of that cooperation reduce, we would expect that both predators need to search for alternatives. An obvious alternative for an artisanal fisher is keep fishing by changing strategy and changing gears. And the problem is that few fishing gears are less impactful as that artisanal net casting. So here's an example. Uh, as an alternative, some fishers could uh, go and place for example, those long drift nets and tra or trawl for shrimp and try and catch other, other species. But these kinds of drift, net, drift nets, they need to be placed in a much larger area than in the area where they interact with the dolphins, here represented by these yellow dots. And here you have the uh, home range of the cooperative dolphins. So everybody is constrained to that small space there. And the alternative for a dolphin is like any other dolphin in the world is to forage by themselves, but this will mean that they will also have to increase their 
foraging area. And this is perhaps similar to what the non-cooperative dolphins do. They use a larger area. But these changes in strategy, they imply in a high cost for both fishers and dolphins. For fishers, because locally, this drift nets, they are illegal. And for the dolphins, they are harmful. And drift nets, uh, they kill without any discrimination. So uh, in nowadays, it is becoming more and more uh, an important uh, mortality cause for these dolphins in this population. Now, if everybody changes strategies, then when would that mutually beneficial interaction flip into a mutually harmful one? To try and answer this or project when and how this will happen, we will now combine everything that we learn empirically from uh, our long-term data into um, and try and parameterize this into numerical models to use, uh, project some scenarios. So our model uh, considers different scenarios of mullet availability over time. So for example, things can be steady or they can decline or they can crash, declining very, very quickly. Um, it also considers uh, how this will affect the dolphin fishery interaction rates and therefore how these interaction rates will affect dolphin demography in terms of revival, recruitment, and the use of the foraging tactics that they use. And finally, how what's happening on the dolphin population will affect the fishery behavior, how engaged they are and keep uh, interacting with dolphins. So now we can project uh, how changes in the system can affect, for example, the trajectory of the dolphin population. So we start by simulating the worst case scenario where the mullet stock crashes. Fishers are quick to abandon their net casting with dolphins, therefore promoting more drift netting in the area and doubling the bycatch probability. We can also try and simulate the current scenario where the mullet stocks decline, but more linearly, more, more uh, slowly. And uh, so do the fishers willingness to in, uh, net casting with dolphins. And we can have the best case scenario where everything remains steady over time. There's plenty of fish, everybody's engaged in the interaction. And the resulting uh, dolphin population trajectory over the next 100 years are quite different in these three cases. The best case scenario, they will reach uh, carrying capacity. But should the mullets start declining as they are currently, the cooperative dolphins might be a bit buffered by it, but bycatch will be especially hard on the non-cooperative dolphins because they range over larger areas, increasing the probability of being caught. Now, should the, the mullet stock indeed crash, then is bad news for everyone. Cooperative and non-cooperative dolphins will tend to be uh, bycaught more often and the cooperation with artisanal fishers will be predicted to be stinted in the next few decades. Thus, a change in behavior here will introduce many negative links in our socio-ecological system. It, it could turn traditional fishers into environmental loss, if you will. Uh, it will increase the mortality of dolphins through bycatch, and it will promote over-exploitation of the local ecosystem. But overall, it means that that system can flip so that once stable over the 140 years uh, system can flip from a positive interaction to a more negative, a competitive one. Is there anything we can do to try and reverse this arrow here? Again, we can start locally and we can start with some modeling exercises. So now in the case, uh, we will simulate two possible and yet simplified actions that one can do locally to try and, and, and extend this, this period. So reversing the mullet stock crash will take just an immense economical and political changes. But perhaps changing the fish's behavior might be a bit more manageable. I'm not saying it's easy, but it might be comparatively more manageable. So one thing we could do if the in, in the mimicking this worst case scenario where the uh, mullet stock crashes, one thing we could do is invest in better law enforcement to try and remove any illegal nets they are causing bycatch. Another thing we could do is try and add value to the traditional fisheries with dolphins, therefore uh, giving some uh, in incentives to keep fishers cooperating with uh, dolphins, for example, by putting premium prices on the fish they catch. 
But again, alone, our models uh, predicted none of those actions alone is enough. So our model predicts that only when combining that first top-down policy, in fact, the top-down action with the bottom-up by incentivizing the, the fishes into a more integrative conservation program, that's the only way where we could mirror, mirror the best-case scenario of the population dolphin remaining stable around this um, carrying capacity. So more recently, over the years, we've been seeing this combined approach, in, uh, approach gaining momentum. There has been some recent advances in illegal protection, uh, not only of the dolphins in, in southern Brazil and Laguna, but also protection of the interaction itself, the behavior as a co cultural heritage. And to me, it's very inspiring to see the locals um, understanding the value of zooming in and trying to conserve this few components of a system for the greater good of the local ecosystem. Oh yeah, for it. So like any other uh, remaining human wildlife cooperation cases that I showed in the beginning, uh, including the honey guide and honey hunter system, the dolphin fisher systems are now facing particular conservation challenges because it requires us to conserve at least four different components. So we need a motivated human partner. We need a motivator, a motivated wildlife partner. We also need a suitable environment. And perhaps more important, we need to preserve this interspecies, uh, interspecies knowledge, the behavior and their mutual understanding between the two predators. And this is quite complicated to, to come up with uh, real uh, world conservation actions to, to try and conserve these four uh, components. So our data suggests that acting early could prevent the Laguna dolphins to be caught in the same trap of negative fishing interactions that we know are taking uh, away other small dolphins around the world, for example, uh, the vaquita in Mexico. The Laguna dolphins are only about 60 individuals, and this is of a new subspecies that is now recognized to be endemic to this uh, small portion of South America. Therefore, disturbing this dolphin, human dolphin cooperation will threaten not only this small pocket of genetic diversity, but also a small pocket of cultural diversity. The fact that this human uh, animal interaction has been around for over a century, it means really two things. First, that is the behavior specialization that has outlived individual dolphins, individual fishers, and it has been passed down through generations of both species, not genetically, but via learning. The four is part of the cultures of humans, and if you will, the, the culture of dolphins. But the second, it also means that being around for this long does not guarantee that we'll continue for the next years. And indeed, the projections are not really <laughs> fascinating at the moment. So there has been more and more understanding that culture matters, not only for humans, but also for animals too. And cultures not only exist, exist but they are key traits to be conserved for the greater good of pre uh, preserving biodiversity. And just like biological diversity, cultural diversity is everywhere, but they are specific to each place. It is one in, in specifically, uh, to me, it's really inspiring because he, he reminds me of a simple lesson that seems to be particularly important in days like today, where we're facing so many bad news out there, especially in Brazil with the fall of the news. And this simple lesson is by cooperating, perhaps we can all coexist in harmony. And with that, I would like to thank the support of my, my own team of cooperators, without whom none of this work would be possible. This is truly a collaborative effort among researchers working in the area for the past three decades with others like myself working there more recently and many bright students that uh, really do the hard part of the work. And of course, the local fishers and the dolphins. So it's truly a collaboration team. With that, thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. I think we learned a lot about cooperation and interactions between humans and animals. Um, and so I think it's time for discussion. Just a reminder, uh, I already sent it to, through the chat, but just type in a question mark. 
on the chat and I will call you. And also we invite everyone on the YouTube channel to just type in the questions there and we'll bring them over to the speaker. So we have the first question comes from Kaya. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, my name is Kaya Tonbeck. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Hunter College in New York. Um, and I'm wondering whether um, there's, you see any dynamics where, do the fish fishermen ever throw um, any fish to the dolphins and can they kind of adjust the payoff that way? Right, thank you, thank you for your question. This is, uh, yeah, this is a really good question because it could change the entire nature of the interaction. The simple answer is no, they are, they, I would say very rarely or almost never will uh, reward the dolphins that way by by trying to habituate this uh, them. Yeah. So I think that I know of maybe once in a lifetime this can happen, but typically they they don't do this. Uh, the fishes themselves they're quite well organized among themselves. They have their own um, informal rule system on how you when and how and where you go in the water and. Uh, when you can cast the nets, and so they have their own rules. So they they also, uh, in a way, policy uh, each other on, on that. So yeah. Thank you, Kaya. Um, our next question comes from Michael. Yes, uh, Michael Taborski, University of Bern, currently Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin. Thank you very much. Uh, this was really interesting. What what was uh, missing a little bit, or what I was missing, was uh, the third party involved, which is the monets. Of course, it seems as if uh, the profitability of this interaction uh, declines because of the declines of monet numbers. So the question is, if you want to keep that uh, interaction up, or the tradition of uh, of joint uh, hunting between humans and dolphins, I think uh, the, the most uh, straightforward approach would be to try to improve the mileage recruitment. And, and I'm not sure whether there are any means to do that, to increase survival probability of mileage or productivity or something like that. But <clears throat> the, the question is also whether this uh, important third party, namely the prey, have sort of adapted in this uh, period of 140 years that you mentioned to perhaps avoid these areas or something like that mm -hmm. by selection or, um, or perhaps even by, by cultural effects, by traditions or something. Do you have any indication about that? Thank you for your question. This is really, uh, yeah, it's a really good question. Really hard to, to answer because we know uh, considerably less about the third axis, about the bullet, and I agree with you, they are the key players in the system, and we, we unfortunately know uh, much less about them. Um, so to your first point, yes, I think it would be at least theoretically the, the best way to improve, you know, increase the abundance of prey to, to keep the, the two predators and the other predators in that system that uh, forage on this, on this uh, resource. But I think it's extremely difficult. Uh, as I said, we know we still know very little about when and how they migrate. So they they can migrate for uh, far places like northern Argentina all the way to south and southeast Brazil. It's kind of a, a long, so it involves many uh, local um, uh, governments. So you need like in terms of uh, political actions that will be complicated by itself. I don't know by now anything related to how to increase fertility of these uh, animals. I know there's some experiments in the in University um, of Santa Catarina there in the area uh, trying to reproduce these animals, the mullets in captivity, but it, I assume, I know very little about uh, aquaculture, but I would assume it is quite difficult since this are migratory uh, species. So I don't have a clear answer well, how to do this. So that that's how I, I think it might be more manageable, manageable to try and work with the behavior of the predators or at least the key predators in that system and kind of hope for the best for the, for the prey. It, it's a key resource in the area. So it involves not only these types of small uh, scale fisheries, 
within artisanal and net casting fisheries, but there's also a big industrial um, fishery system there that uh, focuses and targets specifically on the migrating large schools offshore. So one problem is they might be catching everything there before they enter the, the estuaries to reproduce and grow and, and all of that. So it's a, it's a very dynamic, large scale, complicated in, system with many politics in, involved as well. Uh, as to your second point on whether the mullets themselves, they kind of evolved to uh, avoid these types of predators, I'll, I'll think that the large schools, the way they, they get together in this gigantic large schools might be, you know, it's the easiest answer to, to the anti-predator uh, defense. Um, I don't, I don't know. Uh, you, what I know is on the other on the other side again. So in other places uh, where I show in that map where humans and dolphins interact to try and catch fish together, typically the fish that they are after is also mullets, different species of mullets, but same same behavior, same kind of resource of being uh, unpredictable and being um, temporally uh, patched in space and time. But when you find that resource, you got this like gigantic uh, high quality. Um, high color, uh, calorific prey as well. So I don't know how the yeah the mullets would uh, evoke to avoid this these two predators, perhaps avoiding coastal areas. But then it comes the dolphins pushing them towards <laughs> there. So I don't know. It's it's an interesting question. I don't have a clear cut answer to it. Yeah, but but as you mentioned, this uh, sort of industrial kind of uh, fishing industry. That has probably much more effect on the on the mullet population. So, so perhaps it is unlikely to assume that that this sort of rather small scale uh, business going on between the, the artisanal fishermen and the dolphins has any sort of really strong effect on the mullet population development in in general. So, so perhaps this is a naive question I asked. No, no. Uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, there are other. Other human predators out there, perhaps getting getting all of the the resource before they they even get a chance to to get close to the to this asteroid. And it's a it's a very interesting and dynamic system to work with, and it's been keeping us uh, busy for for the past years. And I I assume it will keep us busy trying to understand this for the next years to come as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Um, our next question comes from Sandra smith -Wengler. Uh Thank you very much. Uh, hello, Mauricio. Thank you for that uh, amazing talk. And I'm uh, at the National Autonomous University of Mexico as a postdoc. Um, and well, I was very interested in the in the graph you showed us uh, about how co cooperative uh, dolphins have decreased in time in these three periods. I kind of missed uh, the details of it, uh, but um, I guess you got part of that from the interview data or, or such, or, or because you don't haven't necessarily been watching them that closely all this time, or maybe yes. But one of yeah. my questions derived from that uh, is, do you have any idea if the skill of the fishermen has changed in time as well? Because I would suspect that uh, as fish decrease, then fishermen have have to also have to turn to other alternatives maybe, and in some other socio-ecological systems, uh, some people diversify their activities more, and that in some cases results in loss of skill or specialization for certain behaviors. So if the, the relationship also relies, as you showed us, on the fishermen being, uh, you know, uh, good respondents or good, good cooperators with the dolphins, that could be maybe another effect that adds to, to the decline or the propensity to decline in the relationship. So yeah, I'm curious about that. And uh, just the other one now that I have the microphone. Uh, when the dolphins aren't hunting, are they propensed to hunt towards the coast? Like, do they do that without fishermen, like use the shoreline often? And yeah, those are my questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Those are really good questions. I, I appreciate them. Uh, your first point on the frequency of interaction changing over time. Short answer is yes, we can track every single dolphin over time and we'll be doing this 
together with our, uh, our colleagues in, in Brazil since 2007. So it's a small population uh, using both based surveys. We can track who is, you know, wh which individual, individual is there using photo ID, for example, and the proportion of time that they spend foraging by themselves versus foraging with fishers in all of those five to eight spots where they, where they interact. So by these kinds of data, we can see individual, this individual this year interact this much, and over time they've been like slowly changing strategies. Uh, what happened throughout this 15 years that I show very briefly in the, in the graph, those uh, histograms there, uh, is there was a high population turnover. So between 2007, 2009 and 2013, 16, 13, 30 percent of the population kind of die off. Some individuals died and yeah, they, they usually leave the population through mortality because it's a very closed and resident population there. Um, so most some of those individuals that died off were also the good cooperative, the ones that spend a lot of time there interaction, interacting. And this could open a niche for a non or a lazy or a non -cooper cooperative dolphin to approach and learn the technique with the others. That might be what, what the lazy dolphins are. They are like more opportunistic, the ones that don't have enough chance to go practice. And when the good ones die off, they can uh, try and learn by themselves. So it looked through this, what I'm trying to hint is there's also learning and performance happening on the dolphin part and how good they are, it will affect how, you know, how good they are in herding fish and signaling to the, to the fishes. Now to see your second part, if there's variation in performance of fishers over time, is the I see as the same thing. So there, there are individuals that get the chance to go there every day and practice and become good and have been doing this for the past, say, 30, 40, 60 years. There are some really uh, experienced fisher, uh, fishers there. But there's also the uh, more amateurs or the uh, the ones that go on a on from they're not even local there. They come say during holidays and give it a try and want to fish with the dolphins. Between these two types of fishers, there's clear difference in the in their performance. Some are professionals, others are more hobbyists. Um, and yes, you're right. The decline in the overall decline in uh, fishing experience on the fisher side could lead to that disconnect again between the dolphin's actions, the fisher's reactions, and everybody, and everybody gets fewer fish out of this interaction. So we've been, through, the, um, through these interviews, we've been asking questions related to their, uh, their, their social economic uh, lives and how, how much they depend on artisanal fishers, how much they depend on uh, fishing with dolphins for their, for, their, um, yeah, for, for their own lives. And it looks like, there's a trend, uh, this is uh, part of a master's student's uh, research. There's a trend in, in changing the uh, social economics of the, the artisanal fishers that interact with dolphins. So we don't know exactly what can happen in the future, but yes, there's some sort of a change there. Um, let me see. And yeah, it's also part, part of another master's thesis. They're uh, not only interviewing fishers now, but as I briefly mentioned there, we are using drone footage to quantify the the actual difference in um, in foraging performance of the of the fishes. If they're good at reacting at the right time or casting the net wide open versus casting, you know, not very well. So yeah, we we're being uh, monitoring this now more more closely. And to your last point, which was do dolphins. Let me see if I remember that. These dolphins uh, also do the same behavior without the fishers there. Yes, and I don't know. The yes part is we know from other populations um, and other species that it's kind of a natural behavior of dolphins using physical barriers to, you know, try and hurt the prey and, and, and catch fish anyway. So I would imagine that perhaps this interaction started this way with dolphins just using this slope of that canal as a physical barrier to trap the fish and, and get uh, close to the fish. And then fishers realize that, oh, this is a good place for me to cast a net. So what might have started as a clap to parasitism then kind of evolved 
in a more fine scale um, understanding of the act, the behavior of both uh, both predators. So based on that, I would imagine if I remove the fishers from there, the opens will naturally come and bring the fish. If they will, if I remove the fishes from there for say 10 years, they might stop doing this if indeed that interaction with the net casting fishers is uh, promotes their foraging success. So, but this is the vision of you know a behavior ecologist wanting to manipulate the system and really it really test those, those hypotheses. And I'll tell you from personal experience, it's not only wrong, but it's very diff difficult to do this. We had in the past um, uh, written a grant to get funding to pay the fishers to just sit there for a few <laughs> we, for a few hours and see what happened to the dolphins. And immediately the response I got from the fishers uh, already you know, told me that I was doing something completely wrong, which it was like, I'm not here for, this is not, this is my life. I'm not only doing this for the money. So I don't know. And then I realized it would be pretty much the same as if I'm trying to write a paper about them and they come to my office and say, can you leave your computer that I want to, um, you know, search Google something, you know, <laughs> but I'm not, you know, it will be the same kind of uh, disruption. So this is, um, this more, Manipulation of the system is something that we would love to do and really get down to this uh, to these questions, but uh, it's too early for this. I think now with uh, our presence there for uh, more intensely in the past five years, interacting with them, we're starting to get a better relationship with the local fishers. Some of them uh, have been uh, even being co-authors in papers that we've been writing together. So uh, we're really trying to uh, build a, a stronger relationship and more um, respectful relationship from the researchers to the social ecological system. Perhaps in the future, and I think it will be possible for maybe half an hour to get them to just see what the dolphins are doing. And once we are uh, skilled enough to try and convey the message that that's, that kind of information has some scientific value to it. Um, but yeah. It's a long, it's a long journey. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we get there. But thanks for your question. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. Um, our next question comes from Clara. Hi. Um, I find that this is a really interesting talk. I can uh I'm Clara B. Jones, retired um uh social evolution. I'm interested particularly not only in the uh, relevance to conservation biology, of course, and your forecasting or ability to forecast seem, seems to me to be very important. Um, from the standpoint of social biology, though, I question your use of the term cooperation. And I'm wondering whether or not this isn't better viewed as parasitism on the part of the fishers or exploitation. Thank you, Clara. This this is a really fundamental question and I think you got right to the bottom of our inability to really understand how the system works. You're you're 100% uh, correct in proposing that it could be a, a, a parasitism or perhaps a kleptoparasitism uh, from the fisher's part. I think this is a very likely way how this interaction is started and what this new uh, study we've been trying to show is it's, it's really simple to measure how much the fishers get out of this so one side of the equation is pretty clear they get lots of benefit with and the dolphin now the trick is we we've been trying to do this for a couple of years is really show that dolphins also benefit from this more than they do when they do not interact with the fishers that to me will be a key component to show that both species are together getting more, um, increasing their foraging success, therefore supporting the idea of cooperation and not only clap the parasitism. It might not work if you look at the individual 
level or the e e each interaction event, we might have you know one where the fishers only got fish or maybe the dolphins only got fish or, but on average, I think since this is uh, being stable or at least recurrent for over a century, it suggests me that the dolphins wouldn't be pulled all every day, all the time for this long. So they might be getting some out of this. I agree with you that we don't have clear, um, clear quantitative empirical evidence of how much the fisher, the dolphins get out of this because it's truly difficult to, to measure this. Um, but to me that we're getting there with this evidence that they time their foraging, uh, their more active echolocation clicks. And maybe I passed this too quickly, but in one of those graphs where I compared the number of clicks that they emit with the, all the asynchronous interactions, one of those in, asynchronous interactions is the dolphin pushing the fish towards the fish, making the cue, and the fishers do not doing their part. So they remain silent. So seeing this over time, it, it gives me uh, more confidence to suggest that the dolphins are not only foraging by themselves and being exploited by the fishers, but there's some more fine scale um, behavioral synchrony there that is key to this, to this interaction. But again, if tomorrow we manage to remove the fishers or the parasites from there, I bet those dolphins will do just fine. They will perhaps increase their foraging area hunt on other species and they're not going to die from this. So it's, it might be a fun, <laughs> a fun uh, foraging tactic for some of them. It might be very important, but um, I think we get, the hypothesis that this is a cooperative interaction has been around for over 30 years. And I think we're now not quite there yet, but getting more and more um, little pieces of the puzzle to suggest that it's beneficial for both ways. If it's not on that interaction, the scale of the interaction event, our long-term data suggests that it is in the long term for the, for the dolphins. They have 13% more, uh, more chance of surviving if they interact with these uh, net casting fishes compared to the ones that just live by themselves. So at least we got this uh, delayed or long-term benefit. So it might be a mutualism in the long term. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. Uh, our next question comes from Veronica. Yes, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Veronica Beek from uh, University of Vienna. I'm a PhD candidate there. And uh, thank you, Mauricio, for the very interesting talk. And um, it's really great research and uh, fascinating human-animal cooperation. And of course, very tragic that this also seems to decline. Um, I have two questions on the dolphin behavior side. First, I'm interested in whether the dolphins themselves are also co cooperating among themselves, or if it's only cooperation from individuals with the humans. And um, second, I'm interested in if there's more known about how they learn this behavior from each other, if they, for example, learn it more from the mothers or if they learn it from other individuals that they are um, bonded to. Yeah, that's my question. Thank you very much. Those are great questions. And I wish my uh, students were here because we're working on those questions with them. Uh, those are fantastic questions. We've been trying to answer for a long time, still haven't got there yet. So to your first point on if the dolphins cooperate among themselves, um, we had a, a master student, lo student looking at this question from the perspective of grouping behavior. So uh, how they coordinate their actions when they forage with the fishers. And we don't have a very clear answer yet, perhaps because we don't have a very clear proxy of cooperation among the dolphins. So to begin with, they can interact with fishers alone by themselves, just one single dolphin. This is relative is not as often as seeing two to three individuals foraging with the with the fishers there. So we we didn't know initially if those two, three individuals were working together as a team, thereby cooperating to forage with fishers, or it, with if they were 
competing for the for the chance to interact with the fishes. So we look at this using the drone footage to try and measure um, coordination among uh, dolphins if they kind of uh, herd the fish at the same time, like in terms of spatial cohesion, uh, dive synchrony, and uh, overall heading of the, of the dolphins. It's uh, looking at the repeatability of those three act, those three proxies for group coordination that could suggest group cooperation. And we've seen not very clear evidence about uh, the repeatability of those three measures across events. But they might suggest that dolphins are in, indeed, they're not coordinated among themselves because they're doing, they're playing different roles most of the time. For example, one might be um, herding fish from this area and the other from this angle. And actually that lack of uh, synchrony or coordination among them might well be the indication that they are cooperating, doing different things. So we're still investigating this. It's not as clear, but I I believe so. I, I think they, when they're in groups, when they forage in groups in other places, they typically cooperate in terms of uh, joining forces to catch fish. So I wouldn't be, um, yeah, I would expect that they can also do this interacting with, with the fishes. To your second point of how they learn uh, and if we know anything about that, Again, there's uh, there has been hypothesis that this forging specialization is passed uh, vertically from motors to calves. Um, in the uh, studies in the 90s, for example, show uh, some evidence that females will bring their calves to to fish with the dolphins and perhaps even push them <laughs> towards the the uh, towards the fishes. Sorry, to bring their the calves to fish with the fishes and then push the calves towards the fishes and in a, something that looked like they were trying to teach or get, get some sort of instruction. Um, with being uh, over the years collecting information on, on the genetic relatedness among individuals to map their genetic network. We've been trying to collect uh, the timing of, uh, of the acquisition of those, the cooperative behavior among dolphins over time. And so now the next step is completing this data set to put one thing on top of the other. So uh, map the social network of dolphins, map the, the uh, genetic relationship, kinship of, among the, the dolphins, and then map the timing of acquisition among uh, dolphins. And then we could, we could model uh, what, what is the more likely way that that uh, behavior specialization uh, spread or diffuse through the network, therefore giving more or less uh, support to horizontal learning versus vertical learning. And I still believe that the horizontal learning, learning from other peers, from other dolphins is key. And back looking at our long-term data, when we have that high population turnover, when some skilled cooperative dolphins left the area, others, they were already adult and start uh, starts interacting with the fishes, suggesting that they can learn as an adult and they can learn quite quickly from like within a year, so to say. So they might there might be a combination of individual learning with social horizontal learning on top of the vertical learning. So it might be a, a big mix. If you look the same thing on the fisher side, which is also always interesting to make this comparison, over the years with the, uh, also through the interviews, asking how the fishers learn and most of them will say that they learn from their fathers or from other uh, um, elderly uh, and individuals. So there's a mix of vertical and horizontal and oblique learning there too. But now more recently, uh, things are being surprising us a lot that some of these new uh, fishers are learning say by watching this on YouTube. So now we have a, a new dimension of learning like this. I, I wouldn't call social, but it, it is, it's like imitation by, by watching. So there's, so, you know, we need to uh, consider this new um, changes in, in our society as well, when it comes to, to uh, this more traditional ways of living. I, I think this will not happen on the open side, but I can guarantee <laughs> they will be watching YouTube videos. Hopefully they won't see this talk and then, <laughs> you'll keep as it is but thanks thanks for your question
Thank you. Um, I'm very looking forward to your results on, on this learning. And uh, just one idea from what you said, mm -hmm. um, that it seems like if some um, individual is unfortunately dying or for other reasons stopping to, to uh, cooperate, that there seems to be like a spot open. Um, do you think there could also be some influence of dominance that actually this is such a good resource that um, individuals dominate this resource? Absolutely, yes. Uh, again, one more student <laughs> trying to answer exactly this question. Uh, so uh, he's uh, looking at the timings, for example, the times the individual arrive on those better and worse conditions for fish and see if there is also repeatability or which would suggest that some, some individual dolphins are more able to manipulate the area, manipulate that high quality uh, resource patch that is the interaction spots. And we're looking at this like fine scale turnover of individuals in these areas to try and, and, and tease apart if, they, if there's more, if a good cooperative dolphin is good because they're good to monopolize that, that area rather than just being skillful and hardy fish and seemingly you know. So yeah, this is, uh, well, I hope my student is watching this because he needs to finish this <laughs> chapter. So <laughs> yeah, well, I'll get back to you with uh, her, his amazing results. Okay, hope great, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Veronica, for the question. And Kaya, you will forgive me, I'll skip you. Uh, I know, call Anne-Marie, and then you'll go after, right? Uh, so Anne-Marie? Yeah. Hi, Marisha. Uh, great talk. Um, yeah, my name is Anne-Marie, um, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, Catholic University of Chile. Um, and I was kind of more interested, or like, yeah, uh, thinking about like the fisherman uh, side, because mm -hmm. you like, there's now so much research about like, and that they've done it for so long, but there are the better uh, fishing strategies and better locations. So is there also competition among these fishermen about when to fish uh, or if there's even like, I'm not certain of like, if it is occurring, if there's enough place for all the fishermen or if it is like, yeah, how, how is the dynamic among the fishermen? Hi, thank, thank you for your question. Yes, there's a lot going on on Fisher side. It is uh, slightly easier to, <laughs> to get this information from them. Not it's still difficult, but yes, with, uh, with other colleagues in, in Brazil, they've been interviewing the fishers uh, over the years. We focus, what, all the results, or most of the results I present today is focused on the main interaction site in this uh, highly accessible beach there. But there are other, other five to eight sites uh, spread all, uh, around the lagoon system, they're harder to get. And those are, so the dynamics among the fishing uh, community that use those two different types of uh, spots or sites are quite different. Uh, and the, the one that is easy to access, the one that I showed you here, there's a lot of competition there because you know there's the local uh, experience, traditional, professional fishers, they're always there, but there's a lot of tourists, hobbyists, and occasional visitors. They want to get in the water and see the dolphins and fish with the dolphins or have been uh, net casting somewhere else and want to join there. And so right there, you can see clearly uh, signs of uh, competition for the use of that space. But there's also in a very fine scale uh, too, spatial scale too. So along that beach is it's about a hundred meters long. It's you know in a good day you can have 50, 60 fishers there. So not everyone fits into the water. So they come up with this very uh, complex, intric intricate, um, informal rule system to define when you can get in the water and you know each uh, their priorities uh, for, for getting in the water. So basically you can, um, the first one that arrives can put their net their nets in the beach, marking the, the place where they're gonna fish. And they all recognize the specific places along the beach where you can fish, what they call spots or, or vacancies where you can use. Um, and then you use your nets to kind of queue in for those spots. 
So when is your turn to go, you go there and you can cast at any time in response to the dolphin. But if you catch one or two fish, you have to leave and give the space to another one. If you're not in that spot, you could uh, maybe partner with someone that is in the spot and be behind them. And they have the priority to cast a net after the dolphin approach and the mullet runs. But then after they cast and the, the net starts sinking, you can cast after and see if you can get anything out of this. And then, yeah, so they all, they all, the ones that use that area, they know the system, they kind of, you know, are, and I, I, what I'm trying to say is, I think this informal system rule emerged in a way to organize the competition and, or at least, you know, dampen it a little bit. Now, if you go to those more, uh, inner uh, fishing sites in the lagoon, then the dynamics is completely can be completely different. If you're not living there, you not might not be able to even get into the water. So they, they it's more territorial in a way. And some of those spots they cannot they don't go in the water. Um, they just don't go in the water. They go in canoes and they line up the canoes uh, like this. So yeah, so it it there's competition everywhere, I would say, at the scale of the interaction site and within sites as well. So I think, um, yeah, the dynamics are different in, in each spot, but they 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 seem to work because if it can be competitive, they organize uh, in that way. I don't know if I answer all of your questions. I feel that I was... Yeah. Yeah, oh, thanks okay. so much. Yeah, kind of like have the feeling of like also like waiting for a surf before a wave when you're yeah, surfing. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Uh, that's uh, uh, it's actually the uh, analogy that I always make in my head, especially because in that uh, spot, the more accessible one, I would say five meters from it, there's a surfing spot, and you see exactly the same dynamics happening in the, in the two very different activities. And yeah, it's it's such a great analogy. Yeah. So in a, for example, in a bad day where you have small waves there might be full of less experienced fishers because they got the chance. In a good day when there's good waves and it's, it's working well, then, you know, the competition, uh, maybe the less experienced one will, won't have the chance to get in the water. So that dynamics across days also also happens. Yeah, very nice. Super. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Thank you, Marie. Um, Kaya? Um, I was just thinking about what I uh, another talk on the honey guides that I saw years ago, and I, from what I remember, it also um, uh, the cooperation was also an opportunistic one where the the birds would get just what they can from um, the uh, from the the honey the hive once it once it comes down instead of it you know being granted by the the people and i wonder if that kind of cooperation where it it doesn't rely on the generosity of one of the members is actually what makes these cooperation uh, forms of cooperation so stable over so long um i guess from sort of like a game theoretic perspective um if you can just both be selfish and, and then it's still <laughs> kind of a win-win um you know that's when you can get like a highly stable interaction. And I'm just wondering whether that factors in at all to the local informal rules. Is that part of the understanding that, you know, it's better not to give dolphins some fish because that can change the dynamic and it can, you know, bring fairness and a negotiation into it where it's already working fine? Right. Yeah, those are fantastic questions. Thanks for, thanks for this. Uh, yeah, we've been interacting more when I say we, the group that works with the dolphins and fishers, we've been interacting more often now. Recently, we uh, the research group that works with the honey guides and the honey hunters, because yeah, the parallels between those two systems are so nice. Uh, they're very they're very similar in many ways, but there's one key difference on the type of resource that they are after. Do I've never been to the field with the honey guides, so I'm I'm just speaking out of my uh, what I read, I'm not very sure how it works, but the way I understand is uh, they have a finer mutual understanding between the the birds and the human hunters because they, they can communicate through acoustic so sounds in a way that we don't see on the dolphins and fishers. 
So there's a, in terms of synchrony and communication between species, this is much more elaborate on that system. And the resource that they are after is slightly different because what, it, what the birds provide is finding the location of the bee's nest and what the humans provide is to use and yeah, a, a way to uh, subdue the bees and, and be able to access the resources with fire and, and machetes and that kind of stuff. But what they get from it is different because the humans are after the honey and the birds are after the wasps. So they, so they are using slightly different resources and that looks to me somehow more of a truly cooperation or uh, yeah, we're working together, but with slightly different goals in the end. On the fish, fish dolphin system, they're searching exactly the same resource. So they're kind of sharing the same uh, resource, the mullet schools, right? So in, in some ways it sounds more like a byproduct mutualism in a way that fishers can gather fish, dolphins can gather fish too, but doing that selfishly together, they get more, so it pays off to, to do that way, which is different on the, on the honey bag system. Um, uh, to your point on if, why the fishers don't give fish to the dolphins in a way, then perhaps they, it makes sense. It might be, you know, if you, by giving fish to the dolphins, you might disrupt that, uh, that synchrony that they have right now. But I don't I I don't know if they will have that. It's I think the the ultimate goal is the same, but they might not have the uh, understanding of like I'm not gonna do, give fish here because the maybe the dolphins will won't show up anymore, will show up too much and start being lazy and not doing their part. You know, if you talk to them, they will explain to you like this. But I don't know. Yeah, I'll be curious to to see how giving the fish or kind of cheating the system in a way could disrupt that the whole um, cooperation at the population level. And I think you mentioned at some point uh, theoretical or game theory models. I think those are great tools to actually look into these types of dynamics. And like, I think every answer I gave here, we've been trying to do this over the years, still got, still haven't got there yet, but yeah, we're working, we've been playing around with these models to try and see, um, yeah, how they can illuminate further the dynamics of this system. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks for your question again. Thanks so much. So interesting. Sandra? <laughs> thank you, Kaya. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll take the chance now that nobody else just wants to ask. But uh, thinking about what Kaya was saying, I would say that here, the number of fish that the fishermen are getting per cast with dolphins isn't that high anyway. I mean, I mean, they get more, but it's like in the order of 10 fish fish or something like that, if I if I read correctly the graph. So I would also think that it doesn't pay off to reward the dolphins that much. I mean, they are getting more by having the dolphins there, but it's not like so much more so that if you spare two out of your 10 fish, then it might, you know, not be that that. I don't know, uh, that might also be controlling them from actually rewarding the dolphins. So it kind of stabilizes on its own. Um, and anyway, so I, I was thinking now, given that you have so, such awesome data and fine data, have you found any preferential associations between certain dolphins and fishermen? Because I mean, the fishermen are clearly recognizing the non-lazy dolphins. So I wonder if certain dolphins have, you know, learned to recognize the cool skilled fishermen. Thank you. Thanks again for another set of great comments and questions. You're right on the, um, yeah, perhaps if you catch not many fish, giving some away to the dolphin might not might regulate the system, but I will say that sometimes they do catch a lot. So I showed there uh, maybe data from a season that wasn't so good, but sometimes in a single cast, they can get out to 300 fish at once. So it can be as good as that. And yeah, most of the time is around one, two, five, ten. but every now and then you get 50 or a hundred. So, and those make the local news too. Um, and that speaks to the unpredictability and patchiness of the, of the resource as well, that nobody is um, actually able to see where it is. It's, Kind of like playing walk a mole, you know that game where it was like, oh, I'm just gonna try here, try there, like going blindly, trying to 
cast a net where the where the where the fish might be. Um, yes, on your second point on the recognition between dolphins and fishers, fishers and dolphins. From fishers to dolphins, yes, they they all name the dolphins. They they are mostly the experienced ones. They are able to tell them apart quite well. We had a student doing a, a experiment by showing them um, pictures of the dolphins and asking them to name to see their ability to recognize them. Uh, the professional ones are better than the other ones. There's a lot of uh, social influence there where the guy, it feels like they don't know the answer, but they will just say the more common name, for example. There's a couple of uh, uh, famous dolphins in the area. They will just say the same name. So it's not perfect. The recognition is not perfect, but I would say it's not perfect using our method of taking pictures and looking at a, a stable picture and looking at nicks and notches in their dorsal fin. But they are much better at recognizing the whole kind of behavior of that dolphin, the way they approach, the way they are behaving there. They are, they're really good at telling them apart. On the other way around, that's a fantastic question, but wow, we have zero data to infer if the dolphin will be able to recognize a specific fisher. Um, they might be able to recognize, they might be, uh, I think it's it's possible. Um, they might be able to recognize those specific spots in the water that I mentioned to uh, Anori when I was when I was telling, for example, they they have those specific spots, but they know some of them are better than others because it's closer to, say, a, a deeper uh, hole in the water. So the fish tend to aggregate there. And those are more competitive spots than the other side. Uh, I got once a fisher told me, explained to me in a way that, you know, you can look at the beach. Those are where the professors are. Here is the PhDs. Here are the undergrads. And in that corner there is the Cuban garden. So like that's how he, he explained the distribution along the, the, the beach in terms of the quality of the spots. So the dolphins might be able to recognize those spots. And if consistently some more experienced fishers are occupying those spots, then there might be a, a context at which uh, there could be an individual recognition. Again, a easy, fantastic way to test this will come <laughs> Look at the system, manipulate, put random people there, and you know, do all sorts of stuff, and really test this. But then it will be unethical, at least right now. But perhaps it, it over the years we could convince them that this could be at least a fun question to answer. <laughs> well, maybe I don't know. I thought I think you might have. Tell me if you don't. But data on which uh, when they cast, which fisherman it is, and which dolphin is there. So maybe with networks, you could get some preferential association data, I mean, analyses that could at least tell you if there tend to be repetitive associations between pairs of fishermen and dolphins. That would be cool, I think. Thank you yeah. very much. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great idea. You could be, uh, I think it could be a starting point for at least a correlation between the, yeah, the individual, the idea of the dolphin, the idea of the fisher, or the one closest to it, yeah, and and we can try and tease apart how much of that is uh, the use of space or or not. I think that's a fantastic question. Okay, so one more student doing one more <laughs> one more thesis here. Great, thank you, thank you. We have a lot to do, Mauricio. <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, I didn't see any other question marks coming nor on the YouTube channel. Um, I was sort of wanting to ask a question, but it's kind of getting late. And I don't know, like everyone is still up to discussing a bit more, um, but I'm just gonna give it a try. So, and then we can close and, and shut down the YouTube live. Um, I was just wondering, um, I'm thinking about the resilience of the system. If we have less number of cooperative dolphins over time, but the dolphins that cooperate, they live longer, is there any way to increase the recruitment of these cooperative dolphins and somehow change the frequency dependence of the behavior in the, in the population? And so kind of like trying to reach a stable point 
of cooperative versus non-cooperative dolphins. I know this requires manipulation, probably having to teach dolphins how to do certain stuff, but, and we don't know yet the mechanism, if it is horizontal or vertical, but thinking probably in the long term on how to get at the resilience. Um, I was just wondering that. Thank you, Adriana. That's, that's actually a great question. It's quite difficult <laughs> to answer, but it makes total sense. Like if they lived longer, they could potentially have um, higher contribution in terms of recruitment to the population. The data we have thus far, this, that was part of uh, a colleague's PhD uh, thesis, she showed that there's not much of a difference in terms of recruitment of the uh, cooperative versus the non-cooperative dolphins, but that might be because our data, the data was a bit sparse, so we wouldn't, uh, yeah, they weren't able to detect that effect. It could be now continue this work for longer or over the long term, since these animals live 60 or even more years, we could uh, be able to see there if there is any uh, differential contribution to recruitment according to the types of foraging that they do over time. It would be really, really interesting if indeed the uh, more cooperative females, for example, produce more offspring, and they also turn out to be uh, cooperatives. And that's one way where the, the, the system could be, yeah, could maintain its resilient, resilience. Um, that implies that this uh, learning is vertical or could be vertical too. But I, th I think things are a bit more dynamic than we imagine. It could be also horizontal learning as well. So I think as long as there's some fish, some willing fishers there, there might be opportunities for some of the dolphins to learn and to keep this tradition on. Um, but yeah, I think as we continue collecting data over the long term, well, uh, and this is really this uh, specialization of the uh, researchers in Brazil, our colleagues there, they really work with the population dynamics and doing those projections over time and mark recapture modeling all of this. So I think they will be able to answer your question in soon. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Under this>. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think uh, Mauricio, I just uh, all thank you for a great talk and an awesome discussion. And I thank everyone who's still here for stay, sticking around for such a long time. And um, I hope to see you all next um, Tuesday on our next seminar. Uh, and if anyone wants to stick around uh, or just um, outside of the YouTube live, you can.